All right, well, we've got an exciting lineup. As I said, our next panel is Building and Supporting Global Businesses in the South. And as moderator, we have Antonia Norman. Antonia has spent a lot of time working as CEO of the Branson Foundation in the past, has a lot of experience in the South. Uh, she's part of UN Women, is also the founder of BizPro. And the two uh, participants are Victor Mulas. Victor Mulas is from the World Bank, and he's the head of innovation and entrepreneurship for cities at the World Bank. And also we have Alec Oxenford. Alec is a serial entrepreneur. He's the founder of OLX, De Remate, and Let Go. And Alex is also a passionate art collector. Ladies and gentlemen, Antonia Norman and her two participants. Wow, it's really great being here, and uh, we're very happy to be part of this very exciting panel. I'm representing the South, and by a show of hands, who here is from the South of things? I see one hand. That, that says a lot. Um, so essentially, the topic is very pertinent to business. We know business is uh, we wanting to move business to be a force for good. And whilst a lot of uh, time and effort is spent in the North with countries like Europe, in certain countries in Europe, the USA, Japan, and uh, Australia, some of us down South are feeling a little bit lonely and we constantly get hit by those turbulent things like political unrest, the huge divide with investors pulling out each time something goes wrong, and um, job creation being affected, the economic situation always being hampered. So today we'd like to unpack understanding what those barriers are and maybe walk away to challenge some of the stakeholders like private sector, maybe government to doing a little bit more when it comes to supporting business in the south of things. <laughs> So I'm very excited today to have two extraordinary gentlemen on the panel joining me. And I'll hand over to Alec and then to Victor in terms of doing a brief introduction. Okay. Yes. Should I just... Just go for it. Just go for it, okay. Um, okay, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks a lot for inviting me to this very special summit. Um, to the organizers and thanks a lot to all you guys for being here. Um, I think the topic of the panel is like being an entrepreneur from the South and having impacts you know, in the rest of the world. Um, I've been an entrepreneur since 1999. So that's like a, like a whole lifetime in, in tech. And um, you know, I've made all the possible mistakes, many of the possible mistakes, I think, and, and hopefully in the process learned something. So if, if I were sitting there and I was but I was 25 years old and starting my first project. I was thinking of what kinds of things would somebody in that situation, you know, want somebody like me to, to talk about. And, and that's what I would like to talk about. So first thing is um, never underestimate the power of having fun. And I mentioned this in another panel today, but uh, people don't talk about this too much. And I think it's very easy when, when you're an entrepreneur, you know, there's a lot of pressure, uh, there's competition, expectations from your investors. Life is hard, you know, there's a, it's a very high pressure environment, typically. And having fun is not that easy in high pressure environments. But I think that the, I've seen it over and over and over, the, the teams that really have impact and those who succeed, in general, are those who can actually maintain a lot of fun in the process, who can laugh at themselves who can, um, who can really enjoy what they're doing. And I would try to think about ways to understand that and measure it and make sure that that's the case. Second, I think, big lesson I've learned is um, don't trust experts too much. I mean, the whole Western society in particular is based on trusting experts and expert advice. And uh, I actually went to Harvard and <laughs> I was expecting when I got there that everybody was gonna be by the a bit of a genius and I would, would be the, the exception. And uh, I, I thought I was kind of a recruiting error. And 
when I got there, I realized that you know, some of these big, name, big names that very typically have um, all the answers are very often wrong. And, um, and it happens over and over again. So trust yourself. It sounds uh, weird if you're 25 years old. Why would you trust yourself? You don't have experience. You haven't been exposed to the topics. Very often, intuition and common sense are better advisors than uh, big names, and particularly in tech, where a lot of what happens um, doesn't have a lot of legacy, and it's kind of you're in the cutting edge. A third lesson, um, I, I, I've got a lot. I'll, I'll go to five, and then if there's time afterwards, I go back. Okay, but oh, um, don't shy away from competition. Every business book you'll read will tell you that you're supposed to, whenever there's a high competition in a sector or category, etc., you should go, go away, go somewhere else. I mean, competition is bad, it's terrible, it reduces your profitability, might make you bankrupt, make, make you go bankrupt. No. I believe that in tech, especially at the very beginning, from zero to one, competition is uh, one of the best acid tests for um, really attractiveness of a category or a, or a sector. It's uh, very, very hard to identify early which are the most attractive industries, categories, sectors to play in. And I think intense initial competition just proves that other smart people, other teams have identified it early and are trying to make a difference. Of course, afterwards you have to beat them all, and that's, that's the second part. But you'll have to beat them anyways. And identifying the right opportunity, I think, is one of the most uh, difficult decisions a founder makes. And, and again, a, a, the big help there is, is your competition. Fourth, I would say, um, don't give up. I mean, it sounds, it sounds uh, superficial, but I think it's yeah, <laughs> one of the most relevant things that you can think of. It's staying power. I, I learned, actually, with a, I was 28 years old. It was my first venture. It was the Remate, and we were raising money. Back then, actually, a Spanish company was um, the best uh, you know, investment fund for tech in, 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 in Latin America and, and, and other parts of the world. It was uh, Telefonica, especially Terra, Terra Networks, and everybody expected Terra to be worth $100 billion. Literally, it was everywhere that that was going to happen. It was going to be by far the largest company in Spain and in the emerging world, and everybody wanted to get funded from them. And um, I talked to them trying to convince them to, to fund the remate, and I talked to them once. First time, I think it was in New York, they said no. Then I talked to them in Miami, they said no again. Sao Paulo, no. Ma Buenos Aires, no. Madrid, no. Barcelona, no. It was 14 times they said no. I, of course, b by, the, by the seventh or eighth time, I was already a bit of a nuisance, and people were like, what, what's, what's wrong with this guy? I mean, we've told him seven times no. Why does he keep calling? Well, the point is, 14 times no, but time 15th, they invested um, $65 million. Now, my point is sometimes 14 times no doesn't mean no. Now, it, it's a, and I learned it, and I've, I've, I've experienced that multiple times since. My point is sometimes being um, phenomenally obsessive, almost obnoxious um, with what you want to do, and simply not, not allowing uh, reason to get in the way of your goals is, I think, a very good idea. And the last one, for, for, this, for this part, is um, be extremely careful with whom you partner. Okay? Founders are the foundation of, um, of any venture. Uh, they have a lot more influence than typically founders believe they have uh, all along the history of, uh, of any company. Um, there's a, some data about this. Founder-managed corporations, I mean, public companies, big companies are, on average, twice as profitable as um, just a regular management managed corporations. There's something very special in the kind of dedication and passion and love that founders have towards their work and their company, which is very different from just regular corporate managers. That can get completely screwed up if you get it wrong uh, at the beginning with whom you partner. So just, just make sure that you find the right ones. For me, right ones are complementary. Better if they're different, not similar. I mean, clones of yourself don't add too much. <laughs> it's like having yourself work a few more hours. But different people uh, which, which compl who complement you, that really adds value to the, to the mix. So think, think somebody different. Think, think somebody with whom you can co-inhabit and have fun 
and enjoy spending endless hours with um, and think somebody for the very long term. S think somebody who's uh, you know, getting started and who's growing as opposed to somebody who's over and, and coming down. Uh, those are a, a few tips. I have those more for afterwards, but tips, uh, I guess he'd do. want to talk <laughs> as well. <Yeah. laughs> Please go ahead. Richard. All right. Um, so um, I will try to bring the perspective from, from uh, my uh, point of vantage, which is the World Bank. And we work primarily on emerging economies. Um, so the question is, why are we working uh, to support the startups, uh, which is primarily my work uh, over there? So there are, there are different reasons, but uh, it has to do a lot with giving opportunities to emerging economies. And that goes uh, what you call the South, but uh, we'll include some in the North that are also emerging economies. Um, so what we are seeing with the startups, especially with tech startups and high growth, uh, is that it's a very interesting phenomenon because it is starting to, uh, to help in this transition of the economy that is happening now, the economic transformation that is happening into uh, technology and how um, traditional industries are merging and, and evolving into technology. So the question for us is not what is tech, it's more when it will be tech, right? So now we are seeing with automobile, but it's continuing to all the sectors in the economy. Um, so uh, startups are becoming a tool for economies to adapt uh, uh, to adapt to tech. Uh, they can serve to uh, originate innovation that happens also in, a, in emerging economies. They can create innovation internally. Uh, they can absorb innovation. Most of the startups, what they do is copycat. They see Uber, and then they do the Uber at their country. Well, that's an absorption of innovation and adapted. Um, that in the 80s, we used to need FDI for that to happen. Now, entrepreneurs can do it. So, so that's very powerful. Uh, it's also very interesting because they can serve also to connect to international knowledge and networks, including investment that comes and goes. And then it's where corporates are so interesting. When you mix a startup with corporates, you start getting more applicable innovation applied to actual market needs. And then they can become global, accessing to global markets. Um, so we focus primarily on tech enabler and tech enable uh, ecosystems. It's not tech by tech, it's not the Silicon Valley model, it is more the New York model. It's how do you introduce tech in different industries? And how do you end up resulting in transformation of those industries? Uh, which overall we try to become a competitive advantage for those industries and the market, uh, the economy itself. Um, so I can talk more about how it works uh, and the gaps that we are seeing, but I'm going to leave it for, for the questions and answers, otherwise there is no panel for you. Absolutely, we go on your list. That's, fun. That's very interesting. I want to twist it a little bit. Uh, you know, being in South Africa and experiencing um, unemployment at over 30%, and we've got a huge population. Um, and then um, knowing that startups fail at 80% in the first 12 months, so you've got a business and you're excited, you have an idea and boom, it goes, even if you get funding. 80% um, of businesses fail in the first 12 months. Out of the 20%, 80% are not sustained in year two. So now you're sitting with a bigger unemployment situation. I'm going to say this boldly, government says this and that, and then our rand suddenly goes down, and investors pull out. And that happens um, generously in the south of things, as I like to put it. If we look at stats again, which is linked to trends, and trends are not there to conform us, I think we should challenge trends, and it shouldn't fragment us. Um, but a quarter of the world's population sits in the global north countries, right? Um, and 90% of manufacturing companies are in the global north companies, uh, countries owned and located in a global north. And four-fifths of the world's income sits in the global north companies. Yet, uh, we've got 75% of the population in the south. And we've got a quarter of the income in the south. Um, what do you think needs to be done, since I believe it it is a ripple effect if we just leave the South, like South Africa, and we're talking about India and bits of Asia, um, and a lot of um, certain parts of Europe that experience um, these same issues, known as the third world country, as well as Latin America, and I know there's a huge fraternity between Spain and Latin America, for example. What can we do to address these burning issues to sort of bridge this 
huge gap that challenges us from a business perspective. Victor? Yeah, so, um, well, first I want to challenge your, uh, your uh, numbers, uh, not the numbers themselves, but what they mean. We say 80% of them fail and then continue failing. That is true, uh, but that is if you are looking to that startup in itself, usually those people are learning. This is a learning process. Doing a startup is training you, and it's training you with some specific skills. skills. That can lead you into working for a corporate, mm -hmm. or increasing your skills and going outside and work outside, or developing another startup. We usually you pivot a lot. So once we look at the startup ecosystems, if you think of them as also gaining the skills for unemployed population, that's a different kind of game in terms of employment or unemployment and things uh, like that that matters. You have to look at the long term and how they, they, they go over it. Um, but, I, but I think in, in terms of uh, what we are seeing is happening is how governments can leverage those uh, startup opportunities. And true, they can, they can help you generate employment for the youth uh, population, but not only for the youth uh, uh, larger. There are two models that I've been seeing. Uh, one of them, they just uh, uh, go for the high impact entrepreneurs. That's good, but then you face this issue of, okay, there's very few of them that are gonna make it. What do we do with the rest? So you need to kind of absorb those. What we are seeing from, from research that we are doing globally is many of those people end up working for corporates when corporates can absorb. So in advanced ecosystems, like in New York, if you uh, were working in a fintech company, even if you make it or not, you ended up working for a, for a bank afterwards. So not all of them ended up in, in, in startups. They ended up joining large corporations that opened that new line of business. Now, what happens in uh, emerging economies, that absorption is not happening, mm -hmm. right? So there is a mechanism market failure there that can be addressed. Uh, so that's something, for instance, we are working in Kenya. We are working right now with Bexpro and Toyota to try to connect them with the startups and learn how do you absorb innovation and introduce new products and services in the uh, corporates that are operating in, in these emerging economies. There you can generate employment because you are doing a new business line from the corporate, and then it, it reaches a scale. So that's one way. Um, other ways is, for instance, what Colombia is doing. It's very interesting. You talk with the Colombian government, they say, like, we are not looking for the new unicorn. We are yeah. looking for a massive sea of uh, startups that become uh, SMEs, but technology SMEs, that employ five to 10, 20 people, but stay in the country and solve a specific need of the country. But I want many of them, so it will generate all that. Uh, new employment. And these are new employments. I mean, think about it. The old industries are going out, so the old skills are becoming obsolete. You have to train the population to the new one. What better than this startup ecosystem way of training people on the way? So those are two kind of models you can use. Well, let's ask our unicorn over there, Alec. <laughs> yeah. Can, yeah. S you said many things, but one of the things you said is that we had the situation where three quarters of uh, Capital, I mean, what production yeah. capacity or something is in, is in the north, and yes. but three quarters of the population is in the south, and I talked about you know some in indirectly about poverty issues, etc. I think, of course, there's um, problems in in the world, and um, I, I think you know we, we we as humans completely screwed up when we divided the planet in 200 places. I mean, it would be much better if we were all just 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 one single. Um, human uh, group, but and then there it would be much easier to share, you know, within that group as opposed to having to share with somebody outside your your, your own country. But that that's not going to be fixed in the in, in the near term. I think that um, there's a couple of things that, that we have to consider when when answering that that comment. The first one is, um, I think, uh, the Western societies, but I include Japan there as well. Um, and some of the richer countries in Asia also, I think I've gone completely overboard in terms of um, how consumer-driven they become. And I, I think um, there are many studies that show this. Uh, the average person is way beyond um, what makes, um, what increases the perception of happiness in terms of consumption or um, gratification even. Um, actually, there's already a whole industry of um, decluttering happen happening in the U.S. And um, um, <laughs> there's a 
an industry of advisors to help you get rid of things because they, it, it, they psychologically, it, it is damaging to have so many things that you don't know what to do with them. So we, we have, on the one hand, part of the population has multiple cars, seven television sets, multiple cell phones, a uh, hundred t-shirts, you know, 17 pairs of shoes, etc., etc. And then at the same time, uh, an another part of the population which is uh, hungry. Um, it's not only, I think it will be better, everybody will be better off if you redistributed that somehow uh, without force. It would have to be, I mean, voluntarily. But um, I would focus on retraining um, our Western world um, and re-educating the population uh, in the sense of understanding that more consumption will not bring more happiness. There is this, because of advertising and um, all kinds of stimulus we all receive uh, all day long, every day, um, there's this kind of obvious truth that nobody disputes that more stuff makes you more happy. <laughs> it's simply not true. And so we're all running, and, and if we don't feel that happy, we believe it's because we don't have enough stuff. We just, it just, it's, it, it's that I need a bigger car, or a fifth car, or a, yeah. you know, the third vacation apartment or something. And it just, people keep accumulating, and of course, they never reach ha happiness, you know, you don't get to happiness in that direction. In the other end, of course, um, there is a level below which you are very unhappy if you don't have your basic needs fulfilled. And of course, that should be addressed. Everybody should have a place, safe place to sleep, and they should have health, and they should have safety and education, all those, obviously. Um, but I would focus again, I think until we, <laughs> the more developed places on the planet, really understand that more stuff does not equal greater happiness, we're not going to solve the problem, because all the incentives are to continue um, uh, polarizing because wealth creates more wealth, and poverty creates more poverty, and so uh, it just won't... I mean, you have gentlemen like this one who's trying to fix it, but it, it will always, always be very indirect and marginal stuff. Startups and innovation can accelerate the process, but it'll take a lot of time, and hopefully we can fix that you know, faster than just, you know, you know, faster than a century or two, which is what it'll take at the current rate. And so. Yeah. That's fantastic. You know, I was quite intrigued that South Summit wants to be more involved with um, Africa and um, countries in the South to p almost bridge the divide because it is a ripple effect. Whatever goes up in smoke in every other South uh, country is going to streamline and vice versa, right? But in terms of stakeholders, we've got the banking industry, we've got the venture capital, we've got investors and entrepreneurs. Um, how, do, how does each play their part in the North specifically in order to support um, the other countries that are less developed? And I'm asking this because in South Africa, again, we have something called enterprise supply development. It's really fantastic. What has happened is government has put in legislation or policy to say, hey, big business, you need to spend 30% of your procurement from small business. And in turn, you get a certain triple BE points, which we call black empowerment points, which is a big deal, you know, because of our history. So government um, has actually put this in place and big business like your APSAs and all your big banks and FMCNG and all of the big uh, companies now have to align it against their scorecard put it against their strategy and say, hey, we need to spend 30% of our supply from, source it from small business. Um, but our small businesses are not ready enough for that. So there's a challenge on both ends. What do you think from a North, a global North uh, perspective um, can be done with the different stakeholders to almost develop that with the South? Yeah, so. It's interesting because you have two approaches. Uh, what should the North do? What should the South do? Yes. Uh, I think uh, emerging economies should first work themselves into becoming uh, better hubs to attract uh, the rest to come to you. So if you think, for instance, South Africa did a very good job, or Nairobi, or uh, in Kenya, India is doing a great job. So what do you need to improve to attract the other stakeholders to come? How do you attract the VCs to come to you? How do you attract the uh, network of mentors or uh, angel investors that you want to your ecosystem. 
well, you need to become successful at getting uh, those startups working and having quality, right? So you need to work in your, in your human capital. Most of the problems that these economies have is the, the human capital is not ready yet. We have a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of opportunities. Engineers that understand the technical part, but usually they fail at the business part, big time. And there is a lot of lack of experience on the business part and the market need. There is a kind of a disconnection, and that's repeated everywhere I go. We see it constantly. We see it in Egypt. We see it in, in, in Lagos. We see it in South Africa. We see it. Yeah, yeah. So you have that enthusiasm and goes nowhere, right? And, and then you, you have these VCs that are trying to, to find the new uh, startup for emerging economies because they really want to find it also, um, that they cannot find it because there is this lack. So then they have to go a little bit below the ladder and try to find that support that would increase that, right? Uh, so I think the work is, is double. On the one hand, you have to increase the capacity of you providing that pipeline, yes. and then the pipeline has to come to you. Uh, now the problem also is, and you go with the legislation earlier, one of the issues with investment is uh, the cost of investing in emerging economies, right? Because yes. first, you don't know if the information is right or not, so yes. that increases a cost, so that they're gonna take more equity from you. Uh, that's basically what happened. Okay. Uh, so you want to reduce that, so uh, that, that doesn't have that way. But the other way is the legislation, how the legislation is helping to attract this capital to be there. Um, and then the other part, which I think is where the North can help a lot, is how do you, come f how do you find mechanisms for transfer of knowledge and experience to the entrepreneurs and the ecosystem? And that is more about mentors and angel investors. Mm -hmm. And that is where many of those economies, when they want to go to maturity, they face a problem because they're very so isolated. And how do you connect them more? And I, I think that's uh, where you have to find these intermediaries that can help you. How do you connect with those big networks uh, that are there? We are trying, for instance, just by bringing like 500 startups or tech starts to some places to, to, to become uh, more connected. But there are other ways to do that, like doing events like this in, in South Africa. How do you bring all these people there and start bringing a community that connects? How do you bring people with experience that is already in New York, like, like, like yourself, uh, having those connections? to work more on those emerging economic ecosystems, to become more mentors and more angels in there. And I, and I think that's, that's the part that it's in each of us to start doing it. E everyone that is here or that is successful, to try to connect more onto that. Okay, that's fantastic. In closing, because we run out of time, I think, Alec, I'd like to understand, I like what you said about education and thinking about things differently. I think we lack heart in, in many ways. And uh, do you think it's necessary for businesses globally to almost have part of their strategy to link a course with their commercial triple bottom line or, um, or you know, their finances and their objectives for um, bringing in more business? Yeah, uh, I think that companies like countries, like people, like societies um, evolve or, or sometimes they go backwards as well, but in general evolve. And depending on the, on the level of evolution of the person or society or the country or the company, there's a more identification with a higher good. Um, I think in general, it is more motivating for employees who work in a company that has a clear mission and a company that does good and that clearly does good in a measurable way and that in the conversation within the company, people talk about the good they're doing, for example, and they're proud for doing that. Um, the environment, for example, is increasingly relevant. I mean, in my case, uh, the, 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 the line that connects uh, the remate and the OLX and let go is used goods and used goods because they have a trading of used goods prevents um, manufacturing of new goods and ha therefore has a very positive impact in the environment and it reduces waste and all kinds of very, doesn't consume raw material or energy or water, etc. Well, I understand that and many people understand that very well and it makes us all very happy to be you know, pushing that course. Now, I 100% believe in that, but I don't believe in forcing anybody, not even, quote, unquote, a bad company, to do anything. I mean, of course, they have to abide by the law, but beyond that, I believe in, in free will. I mean, absolutely in free will. And I think that um, there's a very d big difference between force and power. No? Mm. You can be extremely powerful, but not use force. And uh, that's what I would do. I would not, I, I think if you try to force companies to do that, it'll back, it backlash, it won't work. But again, if you show cases where having a clear vision and a clear cause, um, you motivate 
your, your investors, your users, your employees, um, the communities, I think others will, will emulate you. And, and there's increase, particularly in tech, uh, this is happening more and more naturally. And it has a lot to do also, again, with the higher consciousness and just being more aware because it's closer to love. I mean, you're doing something for love, you know, just without an expectation of anything in return. It's, it's happening. It, it, it's happening in, in some industries quite fast. Yeah. Any closing comments from you, Victor? Uh, I will go with what you said. <laughs> uh, I really like that part, and it's uh, uh, try to get the incentives of people f for doing good uh, and, and align them uh, to what could be a, a good result. I would love more companies like you being around the world. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I think business as a force for good is not just a cliche. And um, it, it happened in the days of old. You, you trade a banana in for a loaf of bread, and people were happy because it was a fair trade. And now we look at governance and ethical issues. It's been absolutely fantastic speaking with you. And thank you for being an excellent audience. We appreciate it. Thank you.